Well, hello, everybody. It is 7 o'clock, so it's about time for our uh, Bible study time to begin tonight. Uh, we'll begin first with a word of prayer, and then we'll also sing a little bit, and I'll introduce our speaker, who is another one who needs no introduction, but I'm really glad that, that uh, he's here tonight. I'm excited for his, his message. Uh, but, for, of course, let's begin by going to God in prayer. Um, two prayer requests I, I will mention. Uh, one uh, is a prayer of praise and thanksgiving. One, a, a request, a prayer of praise that Ron Crawford is back home as of today. Uh, so he And he was speaking with me earlier. He said he had a great night of rest last night. It's the first night sleeping in his, in his own bed for a little while, and he's feeling good, breathing well. And it will actually be a little bit longer than maybe they initially thought for when he'll get the next stints in. He made it sound like now they're talking about you know, it might be another month before they go in and put those two other stints. But we want to praise God that he's home. Uh, second, I got a message from uh, Sue that uh, she is actually, uh, she went to the ER tonight to get an x-ray and CT of her lung. So let's be praying for her as well. So if you would, bow with me. Let's go to God in prayer. Thank you, Father, for this time when we come together uh, midway through the week. Father, some of us may have had some difficult and challenging uh, uh, parts to our week. Others of us may have had wonderful things happen that we're rejoicing about. Uh, and for some of us, it may just be like any other week. But we're so glad that no matter how each one of us is doing, that we can come together, see one another, uh, lift up words of praise to you in song, and hear a portion of your word. Uh, we want to ask your blessings on Nathaniel as he speaks to us, that you give him um, peace and wisdom, and that you'll help him to recall the things he's prepared. Uh, and, and we're excited for, for the blessing that he'll be to us tonight as we look into your word together. Uh, Father, we want to lift up a prayer of praise that uh, Brother Ron is back home, and we want to ask your blessings on him as he rests and recovers and builds up strength, and we pray that you'll bless him day by day. We also pray for Ramona, that you'll be with her as well. And we're just so thankful that he's able to be back home uh, today and tonight. Father, we want to pray for our sister Sue. Uh, she is awaiting biopsy results and today went into the ER. We just pray your blessings on her as, as um, breathing can be especially difficult for her right now. And, and uh, there's the stress and uncertainty of, of awaiting the results. Be with her and Daryl. Surround them. Comfort them. Uh, may they know your love and support and strength in this time. Father, again, bless our time together this evening. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, our first song will be Hosanna, You're My King. <clears throat> Hosanna, you're my king. I worship and I sing. I lift your holy name up on high. Worship and adore, sing praise forevermore. Hosanna, you're my King forevermore. Hosanna, we praise you. We praise your matchless name. Loud with Hosanna's ring upon high. He died and rose again. Shout loud Hosanna's praise. You are the great I am forever. song is Unto Thee, O Lord. I believe we all know this song, but it's been a while since we've sung it. Um, <clears throat> let's sing this together. Unto Thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. Unto Thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. My God, I trust in Thee. Let me 
not be ashamed. Let not my enemies triumph over me. Yea, let none that wait on thee be ashamed. Yea, let none that wait on thee be ashamed. Oh, my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed, let not my enemies triumph over me. Remember not the sins of my youth. Remember not the sins of my youth. Oh my God, I trust in Thee. Let me not be ashamed, let not my enemies triumph over me. Our last song will be Create in Me a Clean Heart. <clears throat> Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, O Lord, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and renew and renew a right spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, O Lord, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and renew a right spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Well, tonight uh, <clears throat> we have Nathaniel Onkt speaking to us as we continue our series on the life of David. Uh, Nathaniel has the topic of speaking to us about a really powerful, intense uh, relationship of David's. That's his relationship with the first king of Israel, uh, King Saul. Uh, we all know Nathaniel and Daisy, of course, they've been part of this church for several years now. Uh, Nathaniel is a regular song leader uh, during our worship services. Daisy is a regular Bible class teacher. They together head up our disaster relief ministry. And that's just kind of the tip of the iceberg of the ways that they go about uh, serving and loving this congregation. And we're really grateful that uh, they're part of this church family. And I'm really grateful to Nathaniel for agreeing to speak. He's now, this is the second year in a row now he's been part of our uh, summer series. So uh, Nathaniel, if you want to go ahead and come up and uh, we're looking forward to your lesson.
everyone hear me? Mic check. Okay, good. So tonight we're going to be talking about Saul, obviously. And I uh, just want to say, everyone, thanks for coming. It's always uh, good to have a, a group to talk to. And as we kicked off this summer series, uh, we heard about um, David the Shepherd Boy, David the Shepherd. And last week we heard Jason talk about David and Goliath. But tonight we're going to be zooming out quite a bit and we're going to look at a much larger picture of David's circumstances in his life. Everybody wants to skip Saul, but actually Saul is kind of, uh, understanding Saul is kind of really important to understanding who David is as a king. We have a lot of material to cover tonight. This story actually covers from chapters 9 to chapters 31. So forgive me, I'm going to run through this because this is kind of lengthy. I want to make it as interesting as possible, but there's a lot of material. So um, the first half of tonight's lesson, I want to uh, look at the story of Saul in his life. And then the second half, I want to relate it to David and take what we can learn from it. So before we get started, do we have any Star Wars fans in here? Yeah, I thought so. So in Star Wars, we're introduced to this guy, Anakin Skywalker. He's kind of the theme of the Star Wars saga. He starts the, the Skywalker uh, family, really. So um, I say this to say, we, we see Anakin, we watch him grow up. We watch him make terrible mistakes, terrible decisions. We watch him regret his decisions and then continue making even bigger bad decisions. And eventually, we see him turn into Darth Vader. The story of Saul is not so different from the story of Anakin. We will watch Anakin, or sorry, we will watch Saul grow up. We will watch him become the king. We will watch him make terrible decisions. And we will watch him make some colossal failures. I know that this past Sunday it came up in Lee's lesson, but can anyone tell me the most basic meaning of the word Christ? Christ? Anointed one. Thank you, Joe. So it's not so far-fetched to say that Saul becomes our first antichrist. That is the first unanointed one. So, like I said, this is going to get kind of lengthy. I'm just going to run through this. There's going to be a lot of reading, but like I said, this covers 20 chapters. So, <clears throat> the first thing you need to know to put this whole story into context is that God gave Israel everything they needed to function without a kingship. If they followed him, he would provide for them and protect them from the other nations. He would bless them and cause their crops to grow in abundance. But the Israelites wanted a king to be like the other nations. God heard their desires and told Samuel about Saul. Saul is the son of Kish, a Benjamite who was highly esteemed in his tribe. And immediately we're told that Saul was as handsome a young man as could be found anywhere in Israel, and he was a head taller than anyone else. Sorry, those didn't come up. I put this in green because it's really important, and I will come back to that later. There's going to be several of those instances in this PowerPoint. Kish sent Saul and a servant out to find some lost donkeys. After quite a journey, they couldn't find the donkeys, so Saul wanted to turn back before his father started to worry. But the servant knew there was a prophet in town, and he figured that Samuel could at least help find the donkeys. On their way to find Samuel, they bump into a few women who were coming out to draw water. They asked if the prophet was in town, and the women told them he was. Samuel was told by God the day before that, that about this time tomorrow I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin. Anoint him ruler over my people Israel. He will deliver them from the hand of the Philistines. Saul meets Samuel, not even knowing that he's the prophet. And Samuel invites Saul and the servant to stay with him, and tells them not to worry about the donkeys, because they have already been found. The next morning, got to make sure I'm right on track here. The next morning, Samuel anointed Saul with a flask of oil. Again, this is in green because it's really important and I want to come back to it later. 
Samuel tells him that the Spirit of God will come powerfully upon you and you will be changed into a different person. Do whatever your hand finds to do, for God is with you. Samuel gives Saul clear instructions to go to Gilgal. I will surely come down to you to sacrifice burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, but you must wait seven days until I come to you and tell you what you are to do. My clicker isn't clicking right. As Saul turned to leave Samuel, God changed Saul's heart. Now again, like I said, the green is important because I want to come back to it later. The yellow is extremely important because it's what I want to highlight mostly. And I'm actually, this, what's in yellow right there is so important that I want to put it on the next few slides because we're, we're going to see it come back. Saul then goes to Gibeah and the Spirit of God is upon him. He joins the prophets and the people who knew him bef before he was anointed and, that, and they were astounded. Saul tells his uncle about Samuel and that he knew the donkeys had been found, but he did not tell him about the kingship. At this point, Samuel calls the people of Israel to Mizpah to present Saul before God and the people. When Samuel had each tribe come forward, Saul hid among the supplies. But God revealed him to the people, and it, he was a head taller than any of the others. Samuel explains the rights and duties for the kingship, he writes them down on a scroll, and he presents it before God. Then the people were dismissed to go home. Saul goes home, accompanied by some whose hearts had been also been touched. Others followed who despised him and brought him no gifts, but Saul kept silent. Nahash the Ammonite besieged the city of Jabesh-Gilead. Nahash negotiates a treaty with the people on the condition that he gouges out the right eye of every citizen. When messengers told Saul of the news, he burned with anger. The messengers sent word back to the Ammonites that they would surrender. Meanwhile, they gathered an army of 330,000 men. Overnight, Saul separated his men into three divisions. They broke into the Ammonite camp and ambushed them. Samuel, Saul, and the people went to Gilgal to, to confirm Saul as king. They sacrificed fellowship offerings and had a celebration. Jonathan attacked the Philistine outpost at Geba, and the Philistines came out for battle. After realizing the Philistine army was bigger and stronger, uh, after realizing the Philistine army was bigger and stronger, the Israelites hid in caves, pits, thickets, and among the rocks and cisterns. Some of them even crossed the Jordan, uh, the Jordan River to the land of Gad and Gilead. Saul remained at Gilgal, and all the troops with him were quaking with fear. He waited seven days, the time set by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and Saul's men began to scatter. So he offered the burnt offering. Now if you'll look at the uh, instructions that were pretty clear up in the top corner, what was he thinking? Just as he finished making the offering, Saul arrived, and Samuel arrived, and Saul went out to greet him. Now, before Saul could ask the burning question of, where have you been, Samuel hit him with a, what have you done? This is actually not the first time that this question has been posed in the Bible. God actually posed this question to Adam and Eve when they ate the fruit. God posed this question to Cain when he rose up against his brother Abel. This question was posed to Achan and Joshua after Achan stole the plunder of Jericho and then lied about it and hid. Here we are with Samuel asking Saul. And later on, Saul is going to ask his own son, what have you done? Well, anyway, Saul proudly tells his side of the story and Samuel rebukes him. Samuel tells Saul that because he did not obey God's command, his kingdom will not endure, and the Lord has chosen a man after his own heart. And thus begins the colossal downfall. God orders Saul to go and attack the Amalekites and totally destroy all that belongs to them. 
Do not spare them. Put to death men and women and children and infants and cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. But Saul and the army spared Agag the king and the best of the sheep and cattle, the fat calves and lambs. Everything that was good. These they were unwilling to destroy completely, but everything that was despised and weak they totally destroyed. So this leads me to my first question. At this point, is Saul just stupid? Is he incompetent? Is he just a bad leader? What are your thoughts? Anybody? Barbara? Yeah, yeah. Joe, what, what did you say? He's a rebel. Yeah, yeah. Anybody else? Lee? Yeah. Yeah, and and we will definitely come back to that. Any other thoughts so far? Well, all right. So God regrets that he has anointed Saul as king because Saul has not carried out his orders. Samuel was angry and he cried out to the Lord all that night. Samuel got up the next morning and went to meet Saul, but he was told, Saul has gone to Carmel. There he has set up a monument in his own honor and has turned and gone down to Gilgal. When Samuel reached him, Saul said, The Lord bless you. I have carried out the Lord's instructions. But Samuel says, and I love this phrase, What then is this bleeding of sheep that I hear? What is this lowing of cattle that I hear? And then Saul answered, The soldiers brought them, bought, brought them from the Amalekites. They spared the best of the sheep and the, the cattle and to sacrifice to the Lord. But we totally destroyed everything else. Samuel reiterates the mission and orders from God. Go and completely destroy those wicked people and the Amalekites. Wage war against them until you have wiped them out. Saul pleads that he did do what the Lord asked and that he destroyed the Amalekites and brought back their king Agag. The soldiers took the sheep and cattle for the plunder and the best was devoted to God in order to sacrifice them. Samuel responded, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice and to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination, and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. So Saul recognizes his sin, and he asks for forgiveness. And then he asks Samuel to come back with him. Samuel replies, I will not go back with you. You've rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you. Samuel turned to leave, and Saul caught hold of the hem of Samuel's robe. He tore it. Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to one of your neighbors, to one better than you. Samuel orders Agag, to come, uh, Agag the king, king of the Amalekites, to come before him. See, Agag thinks he's about to escape, but Samuel kills him instead. And then we have another instance, this is the second time that we see that God regrets ever making Saul king over the Israelites. And then this is where David comes into our story. Now I'm not going to tell the whole anointing story because it's not my story to tell, but I do just want to point out a couple of things. God tells Samuel to fill your horn with oil and be on your way. Samuel anoints David with a horn of oil in front of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord comes powerfully upon David. So this is where, this is where uh, Jason mentioned last week about a story of the, the continuity in question. The way, that the, uh, the way that the scripture reads, I guess you could reorder these situations a little bit, but I actually want to leave it in, 
in textual order because I, I think that this hits home. If we read this chronologically, it's possible that David was anointed and just didn't tell anybody. This is kind of also seen in Jesus as his first public miracle was turning water into wine. He never just came out and said that he was, uh, he was God's son until it was time. This could also be the reason for his brother's hostility in the Goliath story, when his brother was so angry that he showed up. Now at this point, the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit of the Lord tormented him. A lot of people have trouble with this verse, and I just kind of want to take a, a minute here to break this down of what it what it means, what it could mean, and where I stand on it. We've seen the Lord change people's hearts before. In an example, God changed the heart of Pharaoh. In Exodus chapter 10, he said, uh, the, script, the scripture says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the hearts of his officials, so that I may perform these signs of mine. Another instance of of God having, letting uh, influence people's heart is Job. God allows Satan to influence Job. Uh, he allows Satan to influence Job's life directly and indirectly. I also want to point out that God changed Saul's heart in chapter 10 a few minutes ago. It could be that in this instance, God just reverted Saul's heart back to the way it was before he changed it in the anointing. And then what I think is very interesting here is that evil spirit, when we think of an evil spirit, in the English language, we have the words bad and evil. Evil is usually more of a moral sense of things, and bad could just be kind of uncomfortable. But in the Hebrew text, and I don't speak Hebrew, so Lee, you can correct me if I'm wrong later. But in the Hebrew text, the word for evil could just mean bad. They were the same word. So this would mean that in the text we're talking about like a bad attitude or perhaps maybe even a bad mental health condition. That's also kind of where the uh, idea of like he's in good spirits comes from. So when people said he was an evil spirit was upon him, it could have just been a terrible attitude. For what it's worth, I don't think that Saul was possessed by a demon or anything that controlled him. I believe that he had control over himself, but he allowed his temper to get the best of him. So with that, getting, getting that out of the way, Saul does not know that David has been anointed. Saul, having this spirit upon him, uh, has to find a way to calm his bad temperament, and then he calls upon David to play the harp for him. Saul liked David so much that he sent word to Jesse, David's father, asking him if David could stay with him. Whenever the spirit came on Saul, David would play his harp to calm it. And here we have the David and Goliath story. But I want to tell this from Saul's perspective. Saul still does not know that David has been anointed. The Philistines did not allow Israel to have blacksmiths. They feared the Israelites would have swords and spears otherwise. So... The, Israel, or the Philistines made the Israelites come to them to have their tools sharpened. The only two swords in Israel belonged to Saul and Jonathan. And again, I don't want to spend too much time on this subject, but I do think it's important to look at this from Saul's perspective. Saul would, have, would give the, the Goliath killer great wealth. He would give him his daughter in marriage, and he would give him their give their father's family tax exempt, <clears throat> excuse me tax exemption. So not only are you getting tax exemption, your entire family is. I also want to point out that Saul's armor did not fit David, and we talked about this a little bit last week. It wasn't fit to kill Goliath for either one of them. See, Saul was trying to put the old armor on the new king. And this is where we start to see Saul's decline. After, uh, yeah. 
after David killed Goliath, Saul was so pleased with David that he wanted to keep him in his service. Whatever mission he, Saul sent David on, he was so successful that, he gave, uh, that Saul gave him a high rank in the army. The women came out dancing and singing, saying, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. And thus, we have reached the I hate you phase of Saul's life. Saul was really angry about this. And this refrain greatly displeased him. They have, called da- they have credited David with tens of thousands, but me with only thousands. What more can he get but the kingdom? So from that day on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. Saul's spirit comes forcefully upon him while holding a spear. He says to himself, I'll pin David to the wall. Saul hurled the spear, but David eluded him twice. And David is sent away to command troops. And again, everything that he did was so successful that Saul was even more afraid of David. And I I put spear in yellow. Again, it's something that I want to come back to because it plays a part later on. So Saul tries to kill David. Saul offers his oldest daughter to David for marriage with the stipulation that he fights bravely. David declined the offer, saying that he was unworthy to be the king's son-in-law. Now, I point this out because Saul does not want to... uh, Hold on, I'll get to that. Saul's daughter, Michael, was in love with him, was in love with David, and Saul wanted them to get married. David initially declined that offer, saying that he was still unworthy of being the king's son-in-law. Saul told David that there was no price but 100 Philistine foreskins to take revenge on his enemies. Saul planned in both cases of either daughter for David dying at the hands of the Philistines. And I think this is really interesting because it's actually foreshadowing something that will happen in David's life with Bathsheba and Uriah the Hittite. So David, in all his glory, took his men out and killed 200 Philistines and brought back their foreskins so that Saul would give, uh, I think I said Michael, Michal, to him in marriage. So men, all I have to ask is, how much is your bride worth? (laughs) Saul became even more afraid of David, realizing that the Lord was with him and that his daughter was in love with him. Saul tells Jonathan to kill David, but Jonathan refuses. Later, Saul promises Jonathan that David will not be harmed. The evil spirit comes on Saul again while David was playing music, and he tried to kill him again with his spear. At this point, David realizes that he needs to get out of Dodge. His wife, Michal, helped him escape. But then we come to this situation with the new moon feast, a festival in which there was a banquet. David knows that if he comes to the banquet, Saul is going to try to kill him again. So David asks Jonathan to cover for him at the feast. If Saul asks where he is, Jonathan will make an excuse for David. On the first night, Saul believes David is ceremonially unclean and can't attend. But on the second night, when David is still missing, Saul asks where he is. Jonathan makes an excuse for David, and Saul gets very angry. So, like Saul would, he hurls his spear at Jonathan instead. Can you see where this is going? So David is still trying to escape. He's going from place to place, collecting supplies, collecting uh, allies, if you will. David escapes to this place called Nob, where the priest Ahimelech gives David provisions of food, as well as the sword of Goliath. David then heads to Gath and then to Adullam. Saul hears that David has been discovered, uh, and Saul is seated, spear in hand, under a tamarisk tree on the hill of Gibeah. 
with all his officials standing at his side. Saul orders his guards to kill Ahimelech and the other priests, but they refuse. Saul then orders Doeg the Edomite, who was one of Saul's servants that was detained in Nob, and orders him to kill the priests. And this is where we come to a famous story of the cave. David and his men were hiding out far back in the cave near the crags of the wild goats, still trying to get away from Saul. Saul continues to pursue David, and he goes into the cave to relieve himself. At least that's what the scripture reads. I'll, leave, I'll let you leave that to your imagination. Because if you can imagine it, while he's relieving himself, David jumps out and slices off the corner of his robe. Saul then runs out of the cave and David pursues. Saul repents as he realizes that David has spared him. And David swears an oath to Saul that he will not kill him or his descendants. And then Saul returns home. Saul pursues David again. This time we're going to the hill of Hekilah. It's in the desert of Ziph, and he has 3,000 Israelite troops with him. God caused a deep sleep over Saul and his men, and he let David and his men sneak into the camp and find Saul, and he found him lying asleep with his spear stuck in the ground near his head. Instead of exacting revenge on Saul when he's vulnerable, David took Saul's spear and water jug. And I think this is an awesome point of strategy because to take away his water is certain death because they're in the desert. But it's not an immediate death like plunging a spear through him. This gives Saul another chance to repent. Abishai was with David and he wanted to take Saul's life using that very spear. When Saul wakes up, he repents to David again, and then he returns home. David then goes to live in Philistine territory to finally escape from Saul. So Samuel is now dead, and Saul had expelled the mediums and spiritists from the land. Saul saw that the Philistine army was afraid. Saul inquired of God but God did not answer him. Saul didn't know what else to do, so he sought out a medium to conjure the spirit of Samuel. He goes to the witch of Endor. We can't be sure that he actually conjured a spirit. This could just be demonic influence or smoke and mirrors. But either way, this is an ex another example of Saul's willful bypassing of, of God. <clears throat> the spirit that Samuel... Uh, conjured, the, the spirit that was conjured, supposedly Samuel, prophesied that Saul and his sons would die in battle the next day. So the next day, Jonathan and all his brothers died in battle. Saul was critically wounded in the battle, and he told his armor bearer to kill him so the Philistines wouldn't abuse or torture him. The armor bearer refused, so Saul fell on his own sword. Likewise, the armor bearer did the same. This concludes the story of the life of Saul. Again, I know it was long and dramatic and maybe boring, but we had to read all that to get into how he relates to David. So the relationship between David and Saul, you could say is contentious. Maybe you'd say it's a cat and mouse. Maybe even a catch me if you can. A little bit of a yin and yang. There's a little bit of David and Saul, and there's a little bit of Saul and David. Both were anointed by God. Both made terrible choices. The main difference is that Saul lost sight of God and started seeking the fame from his accomplishments rather than giving God any glory. Meanwhile, David never lost sight of, of God. David's faith was evident from the moment he was anointed. We see David courageously fight Goliath. We see David humbly play the harp for Saul. We see David humbly respect Saul's daughters and the position of power that marriage would bring from, with the king's daughter. We see David's unending mercy on Saul as he spared his life in the cave 
and in the camp. David said twice that he is not worthy to be the king's son-in-law. He was unwilling to kill Saul in the cave. David was conscious stricken for having cut off a corner of the robe. The scripture even says, quote, The Lord forbid that I do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed. He says, I will not lay a hand on my Lord because he is the Lord's anointed. And then he was also willing, uh, he was also not willing to kill Saul at the hill of Hekilah. So I know I talked a lot about those things that were in green earlier, and I want to come back to those now. The first is the flask versus the horn of oil. A flask is a man-made thing. Saul, anointed, uh, Saul was anointed with a flask of oil. This is not ordered by God, it's just what Samuel had on hand. David was anointed with a horn of oil. In fact, God specifically told him to fill his horn with oil and be on his way before anointing David. A horn is a God-made thing, and it cannot be replicated. It came from a living being that God breathed life into. My clicker's not working. The second point of symbolism that I want to look at is the robes being torn. Saul tore Samuel's robe first. Samuel said, your kingdom has been torn from you today and will be given to someone better than you. See, it wasn't just Samuel's robe that was torn. It was his heart. God asked Samuel, how long are you going to grieve over Saul? See, Samuel truly wanted Saul to be a, su a successful king. He kind of felt like it was his baby to hold on to. And then Saul's robe was cut by David in the cave. And this is interesting because, um, because the new king, the, the one that, sorry, let me gather my thoughts. The one who Samuel said was going to take over is the one who clipped off a corner of his robe in the cave, sparing him. And then I come to Saul's spear. Saul's spear is mentioned at least five times in reference to his rage and anger. David takes away his means of aggression at the hill of Hekilah, which has been used against him personally multiple times. If we look at the key takeaways from Saul's story, I believe the most important is patience in waiting. After all, that is kind of what started this whole thing. Saul didn't wait for Samuel in the beginning. Obedience to God, because Samuel says, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. The third key point is that music is therapeutic. God brings David and Saul together through music. Saul was unaware that David was a man after God's own heart, even before the evil spirit tormented him. And I think the fourth point to take away is that man looks at outer appearance, but God looks at the heart. And I ever so more appreciate Jason's lesson last week when he put it that way. Saul wasn't just a bad dude. He was a bad leader as well. Now, normally, a good follower makes a good leader, and typically, a good leader makes a good follower. But Saul was really cowardly. In fact, he hid among the supplies, as Lee said earlier. He was afraid of his own men, and he blamed them for uh, taking the spoils of war. The scripture says that he was terrified before conjuring Samuel's spirit, and eventually, he committed suicide to avoid capture. Saul was disobedient. He couldn't follow simple instructions from Samuel. And he definitely couldn't follow God's commands. He wasn't humble either. He took credit for killing the Amalekites and then threw his buddies under the bus. He built a memorial to himself. And then, like I said, he blamed the others, for his soldiers, for taking the spoils of war. He wouldn't even let his soldiers eat. I must have skipped that one. I thought I had another slide there. He wouldn't let his soldiers eat. He placed a curse on the food. Um, 
Yeah, that's another story in itself. <laughs> and when he didn't know where to turn, he sought advice from the occult. So why even bother anointing Saul to begin with? Well, to answer this, we have to go back to chapter 8. Basically, all of chapter 8 is Samuel telling God that the people want a king, and God responding that a king will, not, will, will only set them up for a life of misery. God tells Samuel that a king will take your sons and make them serve with his chariots and horses. They will run in front of his chariots. Some he will assign to be commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties. They will plow his ground and reap his harvest. They will make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his attendants. He will take a tenth of your grain and of your vintage and give it to his officials and attendants. Your male and female servants and the best of your cattle and donkeys will, he will take for his own use. He will take a tenth of your flocks, and you yourselves will become his slaves. And when that day comes, you'll cry out for, for relief from God. Uh, you will cry out for the... When that day comes, you will cry out for relief from the king that you've chosen, but the Lord will not answer you. See, basically, God gave Israel a king in their timing. And what scares me the most about this whole story, about Saul, is that he is who we would pick as a king. He's the quintessential tall, dark, and handsome. He's the prom king. He's the star quarterback. And he's supposed to be strong and lead the people. But instead... God chose a humble shepherd boy. God chose a virgin birth. The real king was found lying in a manger. And thankfully, so thankfully, God looks at the heart. In the end, Saul literally dies by falling on his own sword. But that was only after living his life by the sword. Living by anger, by jealousy by rage, by disobedience. Saul did not trust Samuel. He directly disobeyed God. His sword, wasn't fit, his sword was not fit to kill Goliath, and his armor was not fit for the new king. He intended to murder David. He resorted to the occult to find answers, and he committed suicide to avoid capture. Perhaps the story of Saul is more of an instruction manual on how not to follow God. Obey the Lord. It really is that simple. Jesus told us to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your soul, and to love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Tonight, I hope that this has given you a better perspective of what David was dealing with throughout the rest of this summer series. It really was a pleasure talking to you, and I thank you so much. Well, thank you, Nathaniel, for a great message. You know, it's a, a challenging message to deliver. Like he said, David and Saul's relationship covers many chapters. Uh, and there's a lot of lot of depth. Uh, in addition to being very broad, there's a lot of depth, and I appreciate you bringing out some really rich symbolism and some great applications for us. Um, so thank you very much for that lesson. A little preview for next week. So next week on the schedule, there, we were supposed to have a good friend of mine who lives up in Cincinnati area, Scott Johnson, but he messaged me just recently, and he actually has he's had an, an unexpected scheduling conflict. So. Did a little rearranging. Next week, we will have Mike Johnson from the Richmond Church of Christ here. And he's going to speak to us about another powerful relationship that David has that is much more positive than his relationship with Saul. And that's his relationship with Saul's son, Jonathan. Uh, so that will be next week's lesson with Mike Johnson here from the Richmond uh, congregation. 
But thank you all again for being here tonight. Thank you, Nathaniel, for your, your message. And uh, let's all bow and we'll be dismissed in prayer. Father God, thank you again for bringing us together tonight. We want to ask that you bless us as we go from here and that you will uh, keep us safe as we travel home, that you'll bless us through the remainder of this week. Father, we give you thanks for uh, your servant Nathaniel. We give you thanks for his willingness to uh, speak a message from your word tonight. We thank you for your word. And even as we read tragic characters like Saul and as we read of the... Uh, of the evil choices that he made, unwise choices that he made, in contrast with your servant David, who sought to do your will in all things, even though he did it imperfectly. Uh, we pray we learn from these lessons how to be good leaders, how to be good followers, and, and most importantly, how to be faithful children of you. Uh, thank you so much for the gift of your son, the true king, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. Okay, thank you. Um, if you're planning to go to the escape rooms Friday, which is Friday, I believe, at 7 or 7.30, see, see Leslie in the back for details.